So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carl Meacham, and I'm the director here of the CSIS Americas program. Uh, I'm so glad that you could join us today uh, for this launching, this event, which I'm particularly uh, excited about. Uh, it's the uh, launching of our latest publication entitled North American Reg Regionalism, Can We Awaken the Sleeping Giant? Uh, the report can be accessed in PDF form on our website, csis.org forward slash Americas, and we've also uh, posted it on our Facebook and Twitter. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have two of, of probably my, my favorite people that I've known for a long time, with Pam, Pamela Starr, uh, <laughs> here from USC, and with Carlo Dade, a uh, good friend that I've had for some years uh, from now from the Canada West Foundation previously from the Can Canadian Foundation for the Americas, which is, I think, where we met, Focal. Uh, but with Pamela, uh, who really is, I would say, the preeminent uh, scholar now when it comes to uh, Mexico. Uh, so this is truly a special occasion to be talking about North America with two of the folks that uh, are probably the most qualified to do so. Um, but why talk about this now? Uh, plenty is going on around the world. You have Ukraine, Syria, Iran. Uh, you have a lot going on in the world. And here we are talking about North America. Um, let me tell you why. Um, as many of you know, the NAFTA agreement uh, reached uh, a big birthday this year, 20 years. Uh, though it was controversial when it first was signed, NAFTA has uh, largely come to define the trilateral relationship among Canada, Mexico, and the United States. And to date, it's the only framework in place to define and guide those relations. Uh, but a couple of recent developments served as a reminder of how uh, those two decades have been. Uh, one of those uh, was the unfortunate passing of Robert Pastor, uh, one of NAFTA's intellectual fathers and perhaps the original North Americanist. Uh, long before it was accepted or popular uh, to talk about regionalism from North America, he championed the idea uh, that the United States, Canada, and Mexico would be best served by acting together in their common interests. Uh, by the simple virtue of their geography, so he said, the three were linked and must therefore walk hand in hand. Uh, he wasn't wrong when he first made that argument, and he wasn't wrong to continue making it through his career. Uh, the second development was this year's rendition of the annual North American Leadership Summit, the so-called Three Amigos meeting. Uh, many hope that in the context of recent statements from Secretary of State uh, John Kerry and his counterparts, uh, the summit would serve as an opportunity to, opportunity to reevaluate NAFTA and the state of North American regionalism. Uh, but those who hoped the summit would see North Americanism brought up uh, uh, watched that opportunity pass, disappointed by the lack of progress. Uh, so at that point, we put our heads together and began hammering out this project. Uh, how could we address North Americanism in a productive way? How, in essence, could we further the conversation started by uh, Bob Pastor and his contemporaries and keep North America on the global consciousness? Uh, through these conversations, uh, and I would say we didn't always agree on everything, but. Uh, I think we came close enough and developed the basis for this publication, uh, which is a thought piece on the current state of North American regionalism and on its prospects, both the benefits it would bring and the challenges to achieving them. Uh, before I turn over to each of them to provide their take uh, on Mexican and Canadian sides of the trilateral relationship, I just want to uh, provide you with a quick rundown of our publication. Um, as mentioned, it's been a full 20 years since the NAFTA began. And at this point, uh, North American regionalism is far from being a priority uh, for any of the three countries. Uh, and in some ways, we can blame NAFTA's success for that. Uh, uh, but the success has, in some ways, put the trilateral relationship on autopilot. I mean, nobody really thinks about how to make North America a more viable uh, prospect, right? Uh, and while NAFTA steered the continent toward resounding economic strength, uh, developments in each of the three countries uh, helped generate a political environment less than conducive to trilateral reform. Mexico, uh, perhaps the country with the most to gain from furthering the continental relationship, is deeply preoccupied with the ambitious reform agenda currently 
uh, developing under President Enrique Peña Nieto. I know that Pam uh, will probably uh, uh, give you uh, a complete presentation and wow you with the details, uh, but it's clear that implementing this reform agenda is really the priority for, for the administration, and, and, and it really isn't doing what we're talking about with North America. Um, Canada's political will is similarly low. Uh, Prime Minister Harper's focus it just has not been foreign policy oriented. Uh, and ongoing frustrations over the Obama administration's indecision with things like Keystone uh, certainly don't sweeten the deal. Uh, again, Carla will probably go into greater detail on this, but I uh, do want to mention that despite uh, the close ties with the United States, uh, Canada has much looser ties with Mexico, uh, and the administration uh, has been slow to express the sentiment that North America is a table for three, and this is a direct quote from Carlo, a table uh, for three and not a table for two, uh, which is catchy and I think hits the, <laughs> the nail on the head. That was actually John Manley, the oh, so head of the Canadian Council for Chief Executives. Excellent. It's, Excellent. it's more trouble in hearing him okay. than him. All right, all right. So, <laughs> so I'm just plagiarizing him then. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, and as all you know, um, the uh, political divisiveness that has characterized U.S. politics in recent years hardly leaves room for meaningful reform uh, of so large scale, uh, particularly given the, that the trilateral relationship isn't exactly at the forefront of the American political consciousness either. Um, so this in combination with the numerous international crises that have captured the attention of the U.S. Uh, have left little room for North America. So it's not looking so good for North American regionalism, but I hope through this project uh, and through today's session we can uh, bring more awareness uh, about the promise that uh, this kind of relationship could bring. Uh, NAFTA was truly revolutionary at the time. Uh, it established the biggest free trade area of the world. It provided a framework for a trilateral relationship that had long suffered from a lack of definition. It set the tone for the many regional integration efforts that have followed it, and, and there have been many. Uh, if we look around the region, for instance, you see the Pacific Alliance, right? An innovative trade bloc, uh, inherently Latin American in nature, and in membership, the Pacific Alliance in many ways, the emblematic example of modern trade and integration. Um, so, you know, we are looking at other things that are going around the world, uh, but we're not seeing much progress when it comes to North America. A lot of folks would say that an obvious way forward for the United States, Canada, and Mexico is integrating or finding a way to integrate uh, Mexico and then Canada into at least as observers into the trans transatlantic trade and investment partnership, uh, the famous TTIP, which is a trade agreement between the United States and Europe. Um, Mexico already, already has a free trade agreement with the EU and completion of Canada's is imminent. Uh, a likely scenario in the not-so-distant future could be an FTA between the NAFTA and the EU. Why not? Um, North America is alive and well, but the concept of North Americanism, and I think this is important to highlight as I conclude, the, 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 the concept of North Americanism, which is the notion of a continent uh, that to some extent and in select moments acts and conceives of itself as a collective, is faring far poorer. 19th century infrastructure and a 20th century framework are dragging down the reality of a 21st century relationship. Today, North America as an idea is frailer uh, than at any point since the NAFTA began. So large scale change to that relationship won't be easy. In the report, we talk about areas where this can happen, energy, immigration, trade harmonization, and even uh, in areas where you wouldn't think it's so sexy, uh, areas such as um, the, the states and provinces, which can work a lot better uh, together, which can help advance the continental agenda, and some have already begun that process. Ultimately, what I hope you take away from today's event uh, is that there is a common history and culture that we share, their energy and compatibility, trade relations on the continent and beyond. All of these make cooperation between our three countries not just possible, but uh, the ideal to which the trilateral relationship should strive. If Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. work together, North America, can, North America can solidify its global preeminence. But if they allow this relationship to continue to stagnate, 
the North American idea and all the benefits that come along with it may be left behind. Um, so with that, I finalize my opening remarks. Um, the rules that we usually have are in place. This is an on-the-record session. It's webcasted. We will first start off with, uh, with my co-authors, and then we have the great uh, pleasure of having two folks here, uh, one from El Universal um, and the other uh, from the Globe and Mail from Canada uh, that are going to comment on our report. And um, I'm going to first go to our folks here, and then we'll have that conversation. So without further ado, Pam, the floor is yours. If you'd like to do it sitting down, standing up. No, I'm going to stand. All right. Otherwise, I can't look at all of you at once. <laughs> Great. Um, so let me start just by reminding yourselves a little bit of um, NAFTA and what it meant to Mexico. Um, NAFTA was a very important um, event for Mexico. Um, it allowed the country to create a highly competitive um, export sector that is now one of the more competitive, I don't want to say most competitive, export sectors in the world. Um, most of you already know the fact that Mexico is the number three exporter of automobiles in the world. And if you actually look at um, the kinds of things in, that Mexico exports to the United States, um, does anybody know what the number one thing the United, Mexico exports to the United States is? What number one category of goods? Do we get those? No, you don't. It just <laughs> gave me the answer. Cars. Yeah. Automobiles and auto parts. Number two, computers and electronics. That should surprise you, because we don't think of Mexico in those terms, but we ought to, and it's very much the consequence of NAFTA. But NAFTA left a lot undone in Mexico. It was a very important global reform for Mexico. It opened Mexico up to the world economy. Um, but it left a lot of domestic reforms undone, the domestic mar uh, uh, reforms that would have allowed for the market to operate more effectively um, within Mexico. Um, before I turn to that, however, and I do want to talk about the reforms and what Mexico is doing now, um, let me finish a little bit about why NAFTA has mattered so much from the Mexican perspective. Um, the North American Free Trade Agreement was much more than a free trade agreement. It was a tool to lock in a series of, 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 um, a series of reforms, most important re reforms that allowed for Mexico to establish macroeconomic stability for the first time in its, at that point, about 20 years. Mexico ever since then has had stable growth. It had, has had no major, it had only one major devaluation, but it was immediately in the wake of NAFTA. But since 1994, it has had no major devaluations of the peso. And it has had, had moderate inflation. It is a stable investment climate. It's a stable um, economic climate. And that is, was something that Mexico had struggled to obtain for about 20 years. NAFTA managed to lock in those reforms. And it also locked in the, the market opening reforms. Um, as Luis Rubio put it, um, actually, on, on my website, the US-Mexico Network, there's that plug in there. I knew I could do it. He said, NAFTA was a way for Mexico to borrow American institutions so that investors, consumers, and people at large would make decisions in an environment of certainty and with a long-term view. NAFTA was essential to transforming Mexico from what it was to what it is becoming. But second, NAFTA is absolutely essential in transforming the bilateral relationship. Two countries that had historically had an arm's length relationship with one another despite sitting on each other's borders. Countries that preferred to ignore each other rather than engage each other. Countries that cooperated quite uh, irregularly and quite ineffectual, well, quite not ineffectual, but quite irregularly and um, hesitatingly, <coughs> suddenly were able to cooperate much, much more. From the US perspective, we got a very stable neighbor. We had a neighbor in the 1980s that looked like it could be phenomenally unstable to the point where, um, Al, uh, like, uh, to the point where um, Jesse Helms was famous for stating that um, the, uh, cent the, the Central American civil wars could just flow through Mexico to the US border. And Mexico was sufficiently unstable to make that a believable reality. Now Mexico is a stable strategic partner of the United States. From the Mexican perspective, Mexico no longer has to um, be the victim of the willfulness of the US government to open and close its markets when it feels like it. Um, but rather, the United States now sees itself as a partner of Mexico. 
Um, so the relationship has to be completely changed as a result of NAFTA. Now we're in a situation where Mexico very much recognizes how important the North American free trade, trade agreement has been for Mexico. Mexico, particularly the Mexican government, is very much in favor of deepening NAFTA, um, but fully cognizant of the fact that there are two enormous obstacles to being able to make NAFTA much more efficient and much more effective in the 21st century. First was fixing the domestic market economy. Mexico needed to create an economy that was much more competitive, much more efficient, much more um, capable of, um, of uh, enhancing North American competitiveness on the global stage. Um, but also, Mexico um, recognizes that it has to overcome the um, perception of the North American Free Trade Agreement in the United States and in Canada. So let me talk about the reforms first, and then I'll talk about perceptions, and then something we can think about how we might overcome that, those, those perceptual problems. Um, within Mexico, for the better part of the last 20 years, we've heard the same thing over and over and over again. Mexico needs to open up its telecommunications sector, open up its energy sector, enhance competition broadly in the economy. It needs to invest in human capital and physical capital. It needs to make the labor market more uh, flexible. Those are the reforms that the, pres that the government of Enrique Peña Nieto has passed um, over its last, I got my months here, where are we? We're in May, right? So over the last um, 18 months. I don't want to say that these reforms are miraculous, that they are going to transform Mexico into the Aztec tiger. Um, they are not. There are lots of problems within these reforms, and we can look each one of them if you want in detail all the problems. But what's really important, I think, about them as a group is that they have taken Mexico further and farther toward a competitive, efficient market economy than Mexico has ever been at any point in its history. Um, it has taken the Mexican economy and opened it up significantly in the areas of te telecommunications already, even though the secondary legislation that's needed to actually implement the constitutional reform is still pending. Whatever comes of the energy reform, which I expect to be completed by the end of June, whatever comes of it, for the first time in 75 years in the petroleum sector, first time in 50 years in the power sector, foreign investors private investors will be allowed into the production of electricity and the production of petroleum and natural gas. That alone will make a dramatic change. Femex and the, the uh, Federal Elect Electricity Commission will have to compete with private petroleum firms, private electricity firms. So that in itself is enormously important. The Competition Commission, the Antitrust Commission, for the first time in its history, has real sanctioning power. So it can break up monopolies. I don't expect it to. I expect it to threaten and use that threat to be able to negotiate more effectively with dominant players in the Mexican economy so that they change their behavior so they do not create anti -competitive, uh, an anti-competitive context within Mexico. If they challenge the Mexican government, this government has demonstrated it will go after those who block it, which leads me to education reform. Education reform is very important, but it is obviously only part of what Mexico needs. But what this reform did is it broke the union's stranglehold over the quality of Mexican education at the primary and secondary level. It completely broke that stranglehold. Now, there are some exceptions. There are about four states where it's been difficult to implement the reform, but it will come to those states. 28 states is implementing the reform effectively. And what the reform means is that teachers will be held responsible for the quality of the education they give to their students. And the union no longer has complete control over who gets hired and fired and promoted and when. That will be based more on merit than ever before. So a significant step forward in terms of um, in terms of um, uh, improving the quality of human capital. I'm going to leave my, com my discussion of the reforms there. The big, big takeaway here is they are exceedingly important. 
but I always caution uh, that not to get overly excited. This is not a miracle cure. It's very important to help Mexico move forward, but it is, it's not, um, does not make Mexico into something other than being Mexico, which it always will be. That's, the, for, that's just what it is. It's not a good or bad or anything. It just is it, it, that country. In terms of um, on the back of these reforms, there's obviously a desire in Mexico to deepen NAFTA to get the greatest advantage out of these reforms because these reforms are making the Mexican economy more competitive and therefore a more effective North American partner, a partner that can help North America become more competitive globally. But to do that, NAFTA, and, and to really take advantage of that, NAFTA needs to become much more efficient. As Carl mentioned, the border needs to become more porous. We need to have more regulatory harmonization. There's a whole list. Once again, it sounds like what we've been saying about reform within the Mexican economy for a long time. We all know what needs to be done. And we all know what the core obstacles are. That NAFTA is the N-word in the United States and Canada. Nobody wants to say it because the, the, the domestic public, particularly the United States, will immediately have a negative reaction to it. I'm not going to go into the details of how or why that happened. Long story short, NAFTA had the supreme misfortune of being implemented at the exact time that China joined the global economy and that dramatic change in the manufacturing sector eliminated manufacturing jobs forever. And NAFTA became associated with those two things. So if you ask most people in the United States, what they associate NAFTA with is job losses, even though that's a red herring. But that, that, that perception is there. So the question is, how do we overcome those perceptions to be able to, to um, uh, move North America forward? And I'm just going to throw three things out, and we can talk about it later, because I know I'm way over time. Um, so we need to get those actors who benefit most from NAFTA involved. That would be the business communities in all three countries. Um, second, we need to think of more creative ways to um, expand uh, um, uh, um, uh, binational or trinational tri educational opportunities. I say educational opportunities because bodies don't always have to go abroad to have um, international interaction amongst students. I emphasize education because um, young people's minds are the minds that are most open to new ways of thinking about other countries, other places, other peoples. So um, we need to work on those who are most um, willing to think differently about um, the United States, Canada, Mexico, and North America. And then also in culture. Because if you talk to people who are in the arts, for them, there already is no border. There are no borders in North America. Arts cross the border and interact and interconnect as if there were no borders. Um, so it's a wonderful, not only example, but it's a place that North America can live and thrive and can provide an example for other um, areas of integration amongst the three countries. So let me leave my comments there, um, and we can discuss all of that more later. Carlo. Okay. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Carl. Thanks for the invitation to co-author and also the chance to come back to Washington. I think if it wasn't for CSIS, I would probably lose whatever connections I have with Washington. So <laughs> thank you for uh, Happy personally. to keep them alive. Um, um, you're doing Canada a favor, too, <laughs> though. I'm sure folks at State and DFATE may, uh, may, may disagree, but uh, only good-naturedly. Um, I'm going to, uh, I promised you that I wouldn't uh, focus just on Keystone and not talk just about Keystone and <laughs> how important it is and how much of a shock and disappointment it was. So I'll hold to that promise and I will not talk about Keystone and how important it is and what a disappointment it was. Uh, the button says, what I love that, oil yeah. sands. Why don't, because people can't see from that. What does it say? Repeat it again. Uh, I love oil sands. Coming from, coming from Western Canada and coming from Calgary, um, I wouldn't be allowed back home off the airplane if I, I, I didn't have proof that I, that I mentioned Keystone talk about it. So now that that is uh, off the table, to talk about the, the, the paper and the issues in North America, and, and I will touch on Keystone because of its importance, uh, not just for the Canada-US relationship, but more broadly what it says uh, about North America. I'd like to start by reiterating the point that Carl uh, had in his introduction. When talking about North America, it's crucial to define the subject about which you are referring. There's a tendency to conflate NAFTA with North America, 
with the trilateral agenda, with bilateral agendas. In the case of this paper, what we're talking about is not NAFTA, but it's the idea of bigger North America, the larger integration project, a project that went beyond mere bilateral, turning the bilateral into trilateral on a piecemeal basis. It was a vision. It was taking the NAFTA agreement and creating something that would go beyond just trade, uh, a larger vision in North America. And the argument I think that I've made and that is somewhat echoed in the paper is that it's that larger vision that is dead. Um, some people also claim that NAFTA is, is, is also dead and it's been a failure. And I think there is indeed much evidence to support that view. If you look at the lack of growth in trade within North America since NAFTA was signed, if you look at the lack of bilateral, trilateral meetings and institutions since NAFTA has been signed, of course I'm being sarcastic. It's just the opposite that's the case. So there is no question that NAFTA has been successful largely in what it was designed to do, promote trade and the baseline of integration that would allow more competitiveness, prosperity on all three sides of the border. The larger issue though has been problematic um, and it's been that way since NAFTA was signed. We tend to forget how controversial the agreement was. In the case of Canada, we signed a bilateral treaty with the United States over which we had an election that was extremely close. You know, so going beyond that and having agreement with NAFTA, uh, with, with Mexico, was even more controversial. Um, we have to remember that on the Canadian side, NAFTA was not viewed as a great opportunity, a new frontier. The signing was more of a defensive move by Canadians worried about losing a privileged position in the United States by the inclusion of Mexico in an agreement. The idea of North America, as Carl alluded, to as a table for two or a table for three is a discussion that is still underway in Canada. The quote, table for two versus table for three, was from an op-ed written, I think it was two years ago, by Ben Hampson, who's one of the deans of Canadian foreign policy. He's an academic, but extremely influential in Canada, and John Manley who at the time was with the Canadian Chamber and is now with the Council of Chief Executives, the premier, the peak Canada, uh, Canadian business organization. So this view of Mexico and its place in North America is something that's been contentious in Canada uh, for quite some time. There, of course, has been pushback against the idea that Mexico is a threat or that Mexico will derail a North American agenda or that Mexico is not at the point where it's ready to join us on a more ambitious integration level. But the tide in that battle has turned only recently. I would say it's been in the last year that the last vestiges of the old guard in Canadian foreign policy have come around to the view that Mexico is and should be a full partner in North America. The changes that we've seen in Mexico, arguably now a majority middle class country, a country that's enacting reforms that are, that are generating attention, a new seriousness in the representation that's been sent to Ottawa. The signs are there and Canadians have been slow to pick up on it, but the tide is fully turned. So it's interesting that we're at a moment in North America and Canada where I think the idea of welcoming Mexico, of Mexico as a stronger partner in North America is, is there. The question is, has the moment passed for a more ambitious trilateral agenda? And that's, that's an open question. Um, I tend to think on the Canadian side, while the view has shifted, it may just be a little, too little, too late. But in talking about North America, the one point, and there's several in the paper, but the one point I would like to emphasize is something that tends to get overlooked in discussions about North America, both in terms of integration and both in terms of making the bilateral agendas trilateral and dealing with specific irritants. There is some question as to how successful NAFTA has been recently, has the project stalled. The smallness of the issues over which we fight, given the trade flows, given the movement of people between the three countries, given the rise in competitiveness, you know, there's so much at stake and we have done so much and we've created a project that is in many ways extremely successful. Yet, what seems to gather attention are the little issues. So as we say in the paper, the smallness of what divides us has come to overwhelm the largeness of that which unites us. 
in North America. We forget about the trade flows. We hear the numbers and they go in one year and out the other. But issues like Keystone, which are critical to Western Canada, and I can't emphasize how important we, we view the, uh, the delays in Keystone and having the pipeline come through. But even that, as important as it is, there has to be a recognition that in the larger context of North America, there is a lot more there on the table. Country of origin labeling, the other irritants, softwood, the continuing irritants that we have in the United States are problems. But in most other trade blocks around the world, you'd be happy to have these problems. If this is the worst thing to befall you with, the, with your trade integration group in Asia or in Africa or parts of South America, that would be a good day. So we tend to lose sight of that in North America. And it's a luxury that we have because we have done relatively well. But yet the irritants are there and the irritants are causing serious problems, especially for the private sector. Things like Keystone, but also country of origin labeling, uh, the Food Safety and Security Modernization Act in the US. These irritants, the movement of people issues, the Canadian imposition of visas on visitors to Mexico, these issues harm business. They harm our competitiveness at a time when we're seeing other countries finally get their act together, the Pacific Alliance, parts of Asia. So we can no longer afford the luxury of being complacent about the smaller issues in North America. But what's interesting when we talk about North America, we look at problems with country of origin labeling, lack of movement on Keystone, the Ambassador Bridge. There are successes in North America. And the more we look at the sub-national level, state-provincial relations, the more we find in terms of success and movements on key issues. But yet our focus, groups like CSIS, my former organization, the Canadian Foundation for the Americas, that are placed in national capitals tend to start and end their analysis at the federal level. Washington, Ottawa, Tiangolandia. We don't look outside and see what's happening elsewhere. But if you want to see progress on resolving issues, State provincial is the place to look. We in Canada do not know how many agreements Canadian provinces have signed with Mexican states. We don't keep a record. Um, the provinces are not required, nor would they, check in with Ottawa when they, when they sign foreign uh, agreements. In the US, there is some record, but we don't have good analysis. In Mexico, the states are required to check in with SRE, the Mexican Foreign Ministry, but still, an analysis of the subnational arrangements. What is working? What's been successful? We can point to some things. Alberta and Jalisco have a very successful relationship, not in energy and oil, but in innovation and technology. Um, there are other agreements that uh, our Canadian provinces have signed. Manitoba has agreements on agricultural cooperation and technology. California, uh, Baja California and British Columbia have agreements on criminal justice. So there are a full range of areas that are either under the jurisdiction of subnational entities or that are contested, where federal and national have joint jurisdiction, where there are possibilities for provinces and states to do a lot more. Um, the other examples are trilateral. We have the Council of State Governments that has participation from groups. And groups like the Western Climate Initiative, where six Canadian provinces have some form of membership. This is a US-led initiative, and all of the Me northern Mexican states are members. If you want a policy on greenhouse gas emissions in North America, it's going to come from the state provincial level. It is de facto policy. If Ontario, Quebec, Alberta, British Columbia, and I think uh, Nova Scotia is also on board, can agree with US states and six Mexican states, you could wind up having de facto policy for global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so these are the types of things that can be done at the state and provincial level. The other point is we tend to think about what cannot be done. Foreign policy is the provision of federal entities, of national entities. Yes, except of course in the case of Quebec, but you always have to make exceptions about Quebec. Um, but foreign affairs is not necessarily the sole jurisdiction of national entities. The management of day-to-day -day issues as they occur, the ability to reach out abroad and to conduct po uh, management of international issues is not the sole jurisdiction of the national in any of the three countries. Though in Mexico, it's a lot more difficult. 
US states don't have the same powers that Canadian provinces do, there are still possibilities. Thinking about what can be done as opposed to what can't be done is important at the subnational level in moving agendas. Or as they say in Quebec, it's better to ask forgiveness than to ask for permission. So, and Quebec has actually gone ahead and signed its own agreements for immigration. Alberta is working on something similar with the movement of decommissioning US soldiers to, uh, to Alberta to work in the oil sands. An agreement that was negotiated um, actually at the provincial level and then moved to the federal level. So creativity and initiative, especially with issues that won't move at the federal level where there are agreements at the subnational or at the regional level, we need to start thinking about how to work through subnational actors to start moving on some of these issues. And there are possibilities if we get creative and we use the powers that are there. And if we're necessary, we ask for forgiveness instead of permission. Let me stress though that this is not done at the expense of or against national interest. It's simply a case where we ha each have a list of 10 priorities in Western Canada, in Alberta, in British Columbia, in Saskatchewan. Ottawa has a list of 10 priorities. The priorities are the same, but the order may be different. So something that is number one on our list in the West may be number three or four in Ottawa. So there's a possibility to work on issues that are in common, but where the emphasis is not necessarily there and the resources aren't necessarily there. There are also some issues that simply work better when a governor and a premier sit down together. They're focused on hard geographic realities, hard economic realities, and the ability of premiers and governors to focus on things is a lot better than the national agenda where you have a lot more to look at. So I would close by saying that looking at the subnational level is hugely important if you want to have success. This is a conversation I had with uh, Robert Pastor before he passed, and it wasn't so much a conversation, uh, given Robert's view, he was quite critical of this. But I think where we left the conversation was, we haven't been happy with the success in moving North America from the status quo. We agree that it's done well to get here, but moving it forward becoming more competitive vis-a-vis -vis the Pacific Alliance and others has been problematic. We need a plan B. And the state, provincial, the subnational agenda is an area that I think is ripe for moving and solving specific issues, especially issues that affect competitiveness, mm -hmm. issues that are particular to a region. And in the West, we do share values, we share views, and we share a focus on Asia, on energy, on the environment, a movement of people that differs from centers and differs from the capitals. So there is an ability that differs, but it's not antithetical to the national interest. But there's an ability to move on these issues at the subnational level. And if anything comes from the report, I'd like to see more attention focused on that. Thank you. Great. Well, thank both of you uh, for your super comprehensive opening remarks. Uh, I'm just going to ask a couple questions and I'm going to get to Jaime and to, and to Paul. Um, Pam, um, is there a sense in, Me in Mexico, or would you say that there's uh, an interest in promoting a North American idea? For, for Mexicans and for the Mexican foreign policy establishment, I mean, is it you know, an objective to have this sort of North American relationship that goes beyond something like the NAFTA? There's sort of, there are two answers to that question in the sense that um, Mexico is willing and interested in being part of North America. It will always aggressively try to be more than that. It'll try to be a part of Latin America. It'll try to be, as this government is aggressively trying to um, demonstrate in its foreign policy, it wants to be a leader of emerging markets in the world. So it's building up its relationship with China and with Turkey and with Russia and India and such. But it is geographically part of North America. It is economically part of North America. It is culturally part of North America. It has a big chunk of its population in, throughout North America. Mm -hmm. It is part of North America. But it doesn't think of itself as North American. Mm -hmm. That said, Mexican, the Mexican population thinks of itself as North American more than the population of the United States or Canada. 
So it's a complicated answer. It's not that the government is saying, we are no longer Mexicans, we ought to be North Americans first, or even Mexicans first and North Americans second. But there is this underlying <coughs> subtext to the recognition of what is in Mexico's national interest. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Um, one of the things that you said, Carlo, that was, um, that you emphasized are these uh, relationships, these province to state or state to province relationships, um, and the development of that, and how we shouldn't lessen the importance of those relationships. Uh, but you also mentioned things like rules of origin, and that's an issue that keeps on coming up um, in Mexico, in the United States, uh, and in Canada, of how do we move this relationship forward. Is there something that can happen at the state level to promote this issue, or is it something that we just have to handle or try to push um, at the federal level? That's one of the issues that will fall to, to the feds. Um, there are limited things that the provinces can do. Um, this, so they can impede, if agreements are reached, they can do things to impede. But they can also propose an agenda. So if you were to have a discussion amongst a core group of subnational entities and they came up with solutions and there was widespread support, that should make it easier at the federal level. Also, if there's movement at the subnational level, if there's agreement, it turns the tables on the feds as to, well, you know, Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia, Alberta, 20 U.S. states and 15 states in Mexico can come up with something. Um, how about it? So, again, thinking creatively, there are things that cannot be touched because they are the sole jurisdiction of the Fed, but there are other ways, thinking creatively, uh, to get to the issues. And this is, as we have more contact, more interaction, we can get to the point where this can happen. The issue, though, is the ability to manage the policy. So affairs dealing with the day-to-day -day issues, policy, thinking out ahead, uh, proactive. That differs widely between the Canadian provinces, which have strong international affairs departments. Um, you know, the Western Canada, Alberta, um, has a foreign affairs unit that's larger than some Central American states. Mm. Um, Quebec has more people working, government officials, provincial officials working on international affairs than do all 50 US states combined. Um, so the capacity is strongest in Canada. It's somewhat strong in the US, but Mexico is, is, is weak. So the imbalance between the subnational entities is probably the largest impediment. I would say even larger than the tendency of Mexican governments to centralize power and to, to not allow room for the states to do more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just going to move forward here. We're lucky to be joined uh, by uh, Jaime Hernandez from Mexico, Zeno Universal, and Paul Coring by the Global Mail from Canada. Um, just want to get your reactions to this. I mean, this is not an issue that comes up, but the different components of these discussions come up constantly. The issue of immigration reform is one that you have come up more and more um, with the United States uh, and with Mexico. Uh, you have the Keystone issue. You have a gentleman here with a pin promoting uh, reform. Uh, but you have these issues coming up over and over and over again. It just seems like they're bilateral, but there's obviously a trilateral benefit that we get from uh, the progress of these issues. Uh, the North American Infrastructure for Energy, for instance, it's a conversation that we're going to start to have to have with the Mexican energy reform. Uh, but then the, move, the movement of people uh, and the conversations that we're having here with immigration reform. So I just want to get your uh, reactions to what we said, the report, um, and, and, and see if there's anything that you're seeing here that we're not or that comes out as being any different than how we're looking at the issue. No, I think that is very, I think when you read the report, I think it's really, really good. I think that for the moment, uh, I think that is uh, reflects a, a lot of the people who are thinking right now. But you know, I have to talk. Uh, no, I I don't have the academic approach. I have the approach of a journalist. You no, know, what the people say. And I think that uh, for most of the people in Mexico, I think when they talk about NAFTA, uh, they understand this like uh, it's kind of it's a story of winners and losers. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, even in the government, the, the, uh, 
people like uh, Ilefonso Guajardo is responsible of the economy, he says, well, he admits that uh, there is uh, two Mexicos. Uh, Mexico that has won with this treaty and another Mexico that uh, with a people, uh, 50 million people that is living in poverty. So I think that uh, the perception, the narrative is reflects this ambiguity of the people uh, in, in about NAFTA. Um, a lot of things have changed since 1994. I remember that Carlos Salinas de Gortari, uh, in the beginning he was talking of this kind of promised land, you know, when Mexico will be part of the first world, and 20 years later, well, <laughs> this promised land, we, we haven't arrived at that promised land. But at the same time, it's true that the middle class has grown up, the so-called uh, Walmart effect, and uh, less people is coming to the United States looking for jobs. Uh, and, and I think that in, in, in that sense, uh, NAFTA has been good. I think that we can say that uh, from Mexico and the United States and Canada, we can agree that NAFTA has been a good. Mm -hmm not so good for Mexico and maybe uh, really good for much better for the United States. And this ambiguity uh, for me is, is fascinating because I, I remember uh, uh, El Universal uh, conducted a, a poll in um, December. It was fantastic, this, the, the findings, because uh, I have here 50% of the people they believe that the, the treaty has been really good for the United States, 50%. And only 9% thinks that this has been good for Mexico. Only 9%? 9%. 9%. Uh -huh, 9%. 9%. But <laughs> the, the fascinating is that 50%, it, 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 they think, well, what about if we uh, have an, a referendum today or tomorrow? Mm -hmm. What do you think? You, you will vote in favor of the NAFTA? 50% say yes, we want to be part of NAFTA. So it's true that most of the Mexican thinks that uh, this relation with, with the United States and also with Canada has been unfair. And, and when you think about, for example, the border, mm -hmm. after the terrorist attacks in 2001, the border, wow, gosh, it's a nightmare, mm -hmm. you know, Pamela, the border and sometimes you have to spend three or four hours in the border just to cross from Tijuana to San Diego. And, uh, and the immigration reform is a long, long story and we don't understand, we don't understand why. Uh, when I was uh, correspondent in Spain in the 90s, I was covering all this, this process of the European Union and you know, when the German decides, well, we, we're going to put a lot of money uh, to, I don't know, in, infrastructure for Spain or Portugal or Greece. This, and here it was not the case. It, we only want, we are talking about only of competitiveness. And what about the development? Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think that uh, right now is, uh, I think that the question is, you know, why? we have to talk about the up upgrading the NAFTA. Mm -hmm. I think that the question is, why now? Mm -hmm. And I think that why now is because <laughs> we are watching China that is already in the hemisphere. The Russians also are, you know, trying to once again re-engage with the hemisphere. And I think that uh, for the Mexican government and the United States government and Canada, I think less Canada. <laughs> Uh, we think that it's important to upgrade the NAFTA, but, but, it is a big, but. I think that, uh, in watching the report, I think that uh, from the point of view, from the Mexican part, we have to put on the table uh, uh, the subsidies. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, for the Mexican government, they say, well, what about the subsidies? Agricultural subsidies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And w because we are talking about the, you know, uh, uh, regulation, more regulations, and uh, but the, uh, you are 
listening a growing number of people talking about this. So in short, I, I, I would say that everybody thinks that until now, the NAFTA has been good, not so fair mm -hmm. for Mexico, but everyone knows that we have to be there. Mm -hmm. What are the perspectives from the Canadian side? How do well, you I, should, I should say at the outset that I haven't uh, lived in Canada for most of the last 30 years, so I tend to write for them, but, but to properly reflect the country, I probably can't do. What I will try and do is just make kind of two or three counterpoints um, to some of the things that have been said. First of all, um, it's often instructive to watch politicians who care a lot uh, about um, how they're playing at home. And I think the manifest disinterest that uh, surrounded the last Three Amigos Summit uh, shouldn't be dismissed. Um, all three of those politicians, or certainly the Canadian and American uh, leaders uh, wanted it to be over. Um, this was not a great opportunity. This was uh, an exercise in, okay, we've got to do this, let's limit the damage. Um, the second thing I would say is, and I have spent a lot of time in Europe, same time you were there, is the world is littered with um, organizations and, uh, and treaty arrangements that have kind of outlived their usefulness, but nobody ever wants to say, oh God, let's shut that down. <laughs> um, there's, uh, you know, the big ideas behind the European Union, frankly, even the big idea behind uh, NATO, um, the big idea about North Americanism, all these things, you know, uh, no one ever wants to say, okay, that worked, it suited a time and place, and maybe it's not the right vehicle or the right arrangement to move forward. Um, there's lots of people in Europe looking back at Maastricht and saying, you know, we probably really shouldn't have done common monetary policy without common fiscal policy. And there's plenty of people in NATO right now shaking their heads and saying, we really are going to go to war for Latvia or not? Um, things time often grow beyond their original vision and sometimes uh, they create new problems. I guess the third thing I, I would say is um, there's clearly two fundamentally vital bilateral relationships going on here. It may be that there's two tables for two, and not, may not be a bad thing. The underlying notion that a table for three, that somehow North Americanism is by definition better than two powerful bilateral relationships structured perhaps differently. Uh, with a third bilateral relationship, again, the Mexico relationship, which is frankly far less important to either country, uh, underpinned by far less trade, far less common history, far less common, there is no common border, that kind of thing. Um, it, it, it may be that two tables for two is a more practical solution moving forward, even if it is unpopular with the elites and the intelligentsia. You know, I mean, it's like, uh, uh, Trilateralism has got such a nice sound to it. Um, I guess the I guess the next thing I would say is that big ideas drive uh, organizations or treaty arrangements. Can't always achieve it off the bat. I mean, people are still working on making NAFTA work as much of a success as it has been, but. Tinkering around the edges doesn't revitalize uh, a piece of ideology. So unless you can make a really powerful argument of a North America with, say, a common security policy, I mean, can anybody really imagine Mexico in NORAD right now? Or uh, North America with open borders and free movement? Um, if you don't have big ideas, it's very, very hard to engage um, beyond the elites in terms of selling something. Now, those ideas may be perfectly justified. I'm not here to say they are or they're not, but, but um, kind of talking about uh, harmonizing regulatory policies on dairy exports and you know the size of drill bits, um, those are all good things, but they're not going to underpin some renaissance for 
North Americanism. So on that rather kind of uh, <laughs> underwhelming note, I'll <laughs> see. No, it's a good note, good note. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I just looked at the time. We've been talking for a little over an hour. And I would like to include the folks that are, that are in the audience and get a couple questions uh, before we end. So I'm going to start here in the front. You can get a microphone, Ian. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Victoria Rietig. I work at the Migration Policy Institute. Um, thank you very much for this extremely rich discussion and also for the, for the counter proposal that came in at the ending. It's, it's been very enjoyable to listen, really. Um, two ideas stuck out for me, and they stuck out for me, one from Pam and one from um, Carlo, Carlo, right? Um, and they stuck out for me because um, at the Migration Policy Institute, I'm in charge of the so-called Regional Migration Study Group, which is MPI's core initiative in the region, focusing especially on Canada, US, Mexico, um, and parts of Central America. So the two ideas that were mentioned and that kind of weave through my work every day is on the one hand the increased trilateral educational opportunities that you mentioned towards the end of your comment, and on the other hand the idea that maybe we should look less at a, at a national level solution or cooperation but more at province state level. Now, having said that, and <laughs> keeping this short slide of the comment, so the question is simply, could you flesh out a little more these ideas um, of, um, of specific um, educational cooperation? Were you just thinking of the 100,000 uh, strong initiative, or are there other things that you could talk about? And uh, the same on your hand, in which areas do you see the most promising uh, uh, ways of cooperation happening on provincial state level? Thank you. In terms of educational cooperation, uh, there, there are multiple levels and multiple ways and multiple challenges. Um, just start, I'm gonna start at the bottom and work my way up. Um, when we're talking about children in primary and secondary school, there is a whole, there are tens of thousands of children that we share between the United States and Mexico, much less true um, in, the, in the area of Canada. But these are children who were either educated for a good part of their life in the United States and then deported with their, with their parents, or they are children who were educated in one country or another and then split because of a divorce. But whichever it is, it's their children that are increasingly are getting part of their education in Mexico and part of the United States, and there is absolutely no coordination whatsoever there. Um, and it's very detrimental to the education of the children. So how do we manage that better? Um, second, um, there is the question of the, 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 um, is the actual issue of study abroad and going abroad. Because one of the problems we have when we think about the idea of the North American idea is having the attitude about our community in North America that we are all North American, or at a minimum, that we are all um, equal partners on this continent. Um, and every, all three of the countries um, are arrogant about themselves. They, they know that they are culturally superior to the other two. Um, they they um, strongly dislike being treated as if they were not the culturally superior, they're the culturally inferior, and you constantly feed into that. Um, and one of the things that you, you overcome that is through this appreciation of one another. Um, at study abroad is expensive, but we can do things like um, have children in their junior and senior years of high school go to one of the other countries for the summer or for a month and go to parts of the country that are very different from where they are from. Um, you can have uh, grants that um, encourage uh, graduate studies about the other. One of the things that's really striking in education is the dearth of Mexican studies in the United States and Canada and the dearth of US studies in Mexico. We're really, really important to each other, and we know we're important, but we do not understand each other, and we make no attempt to do so. Um, so that's what I'm thinking of. And then the standard study abroad at university, but also using technology. So you can create joint projects in courses, whether it's courses in engineering, courses in, in, in healthcare, courses in medicine, whatever it is, not just in you know, US, Mexico studies. Um, so that you have the interaction because we have shared problems and the more we interact to deal with those problems the more we can appreciate that the solution can be found by working together and communicating and learning from one another. 
so to pick up on education, in Canada, education is the jurisdiction of the provinces. Uh, there is no Ministry of Education. Each province sets education policy. So in terms of moving on migration, one of the issues are attraction of foreign students, uh, especially in parts of Canada where we need migration, um, where we need workers, we need people. The bringing in students at the, post, at the secondary level, post-secondary level, is actually a vehicle for immigration. So the provinces have the tool to bring people into Canada, in the provinces to study, to gain work experience, and then to transition them to landed status, uh, green card status, and then to move them to immigration. So in terms of that vehicle for professionals, the provinces have a, a great lever. In addition, in terms of skills recognition, um, credentials for jobs, this is an area that also falls under the provinces. So it's a major problem for Canadian immigration when we have federal immigration officers from citizenship and immigration abroad in embassies and high commissions recruiting people to come to Canada based on job surveys that are national, and then the folks wind up in Winnipeg, where they wind up in St. John or St. John's. And the requirements to work in the province um, are different than what they were led to believe at the recruitment level abroad. So if you have the ability to target specific countries with credential recognition, you will in de facto privilege certain countries in terms of the success of immigrants in the labor market in your province. So there are levers that the provinces can pull and credentials is one. The Temporary Farm Workers Program is another. The provinces have a great deal of leeway in terms of influencing decisions at the federal level uh, with the Temporary Farm Workers Program despite the recent uh, problems that we've had. Uh, the demand for workers in the West is, is so substantial, so different from the rest of Canada that that lever will continue to be on the table. In addition, you have initiatives. Quebec, in essence, before our TTIP, before the Canada-EU free trade agreement, Quebec, in essence, went to Europe and signed its own labor mobility agreement ahead of the, ahead of the feds. And the feds were first forced to, in essence, um, deal with it after it had been signed. Um, Alberta is doing something similar with decommissioning U.S. soldiers. Um, the ability to set an agenda and then to have Ottawa follow. So we have a great deal more room. On the trilateral level, I see a possibility in the future of infrastructure. The demands in Canada with the oil sands, if we get any of the plays on LNG, liquid natural gas in British Columbia, any of the export plays, the demands for labor to build this will be immense. Uh, on top of the infrastructure needs we already have, improvement in ports, bridges and roads, and another rail line. Mexico is looking at 300 billion? Was that the proposal by the government for infrastructure? Infrastructure? Yeah. 300 billion pesos. So huge, huge demand. And if the US ever gets its act together for infrastructure, I don't see how we're gonna be able to juggle this simultaneously, have three separate workforces for the scope of the mega projects that we're looking at. So I think there could be pressure there to have greater mobility in the trades, especially associated with infrastructure and construction. I, I simply don't see any way that we can do it. Um, if we have LNG, if we have the oil sands continue to develop, if Mexico spends the money it's talking about on rail and other things, and if the U.S. gets its act together at all in infrastructure, you look at the workforce, it simply doesn't work unless we start talking about moving people back and forth. Hector, and up here up front, I think that'll be it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Hector Chamis uh, from Georgetown. Um, I have a comment and I would like to ask you to reflect on it because it's not a question. It's basically, a region is more than a trade agreement and, and a pipeline <laughs> and, and tariffs and regulations. A region is a normative order, fundamentally. And uh, one of the big criticisms, I was also a friend of Bob Pastor's, <laughs> and so one of the most common criticisms that he had to face was that people would say, Bob, that's not a region. And, uh, and he fought it against that, you know, all, all his life since he started with this idea about 15, 10, 15 years ago. I think that the metaphor of the two tables captures that. 
that the, there is no one table for three because there is not a common normative order that can constitute that region. But there are two uh, separate nor sub normative orders that does capture that precisely, which is the border regions. Uh, Texas is a region, or Texas, if you know Jaime would say, and uh, and and I, I in a way, uh, this is the. The, the title of the, of, the, of the meeting reflects that, reawakening a giant. Well, I mean, it's not sleeping, it has a manual from scratch that is not a region, it's a, it's a trade agreement, it's, a it's not even a customs union. And, and maybe the, there is you know, something called path dependency and, and this is what you see, is, is that deeper level or larger level normative uh, component uh, when I say norms, I mean norms, institutions, organizations, ways of doing things, uh, regardless of language and other things, that is not there, hasn't been from the beginning of this institution, NAFTA, and hasn't developed. So uh, perhaps this is the, the problem of the giant, uh, sleeping giant, right? <laughs> Thank you. Well, let me get the gentleman up here in front who had a question, and, and then we'll be able to do both. And since we're running a little bit out of time. Uh, hello, my name is Jose Pulido. I work for Mitsui & Co. I wanted to ask about the energy reforms. Is this the way that there might be more integration in the North American region, bringing in that investment from the U.S. and Canada into Mexico? Uh, thank you very much. Want to start? Energy first. Let me do oh, energy okay. first. Yeah. 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 I'll follow I energy. think as a, as a quick answer to the question, when we were talking about North America. There is no North American energy platform at present, and the Mexican reforms aren't going to create a North American energy platform. They create opportunities for U.S. and Canadian and other foreign firms to enter into the Mexican market. But right now, we don't have a trinational energy market. There are parts of the market that are binational, dual binational, but in general, we've got a large three national market with a little bit of overlap. Let me use energy to, to try and tackle both questions. The reforms are generating interest in parts of Canada, and the reforms are not just hydrocarbons. It's electricity, it's renewables. So the Mexican government, uh, we're actually working very closely with them in Alberta, and they're going to come up to Calgary uh, on June 2nd and do a presentation on the reforms and we've been working with them to do some research and opportunities for Western Canada. Um, they've chosen Calgary as the first place outside of Mexico to do a foreign presentation on the reforms, which will be tabled but won't be passed. So I, I think that in some ways, the idea of North America, the idea that the three countries share things, not everything, but perhaps idiosyncratically, but perhaps where there is enough commonality that the closeness, what we've gone through over the past 20 years, creates privileges and it creates preferences within North America. And this is what I think we're seeing with the energy reforms. The fact that they chose Canada as the first stop, um, I don't think would have come other than the, the relationship with NAFTA, other than the fact that Alberta has established offices, has a foreign office in, a, in Mexico City and one in Jalisco. So uh, I think that some of the things that we've done in NAFTA have led to sort of this sort of de facto um, arrangement. The table for two works for some issues, and some issues require a table for three. The problem with the bigger idea for North America is that we thought if we don't have a table for three for everything, it's been a failure. But there has to be recognition that some issues, the Arctic, lo siento, pero. <laughs> 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 I, I don't see having a seat for Mexico <laughs> at a discussion about the Arctic. But energy, rules of origin. If we have three separate agreements with the European Union, three separate rules of origin, three separate sets of accumulation with the EU, does that really work? Some things require a table for three, but not everything. I, I would share that viewpoint. Um, I, I, I do think that there's so many things that we have in common. And one of the issues that was raised in, in the writing of this, and we had this good email discussion with, with Pamela and with Carla, was you know, how urgent these things really are. And, and the reality is that you know, 
if we don't make these reforms tomorrow, it doesn't mean that much is going to change. But as we look into the future, in the midterm in particular, the things that we have in common, the challenges that we have with infrastructure, the issues that we have with energy, the issues that we have with the movement of people, the commonalities that we have with culture. And it's not, it's not the Southwest anymore yeah. only. Uh, when you're looking at uh, demographic changes in the United States, and uh, during the last 10 years, the way that uh, Americans of Hispanic descent and the majority of those Americans are of Mexican descent, how it's increased is, is, is something that uh, will uh, be felt in the country, and the country is, uh, is evolving the way it has when it did with Italian Americans or with any other group. The only issue is that these folks, we share a border with Mexico. So uh, some of these changes are not by choice. It's just a reality that we're going to have to deal with. So it's taking the positives, as you mentioned, Carlo, not for everything. Sometimes it'll be a table for two, as you mentioned. But for other issues, it's just a necessity to have to deal with the, the three countries together because it does work for our own benefit, and it pretty much is something that we all have in common. So that, that's, that's how I would look at that issue. Um, Can I, sorry. The, the, the other importance is, you know, we look at the TPP and the rise of a Trans-Pacific or a Pacific Rim trading group. The reality is that this will be hugely important, uh, but agreements this large are based on sub-regional groupings. Global supply chains start with regional supply chains. And the basis for our trade in Asia is going to be through North America. So while the larger issues of the region may not be there in terms of competitiveness, in terms of being able to deal with the Pacific Alliance, the RCEP, the other trade group, ASEAN, as it gets its act together, sub-regional entities, not sub-national, but sub-regional entities, regional supply chains are the basis for global competition especially in a world where the price of oil is at $100 a barrel. The idea of globalization gets confined more to regionalism and from regionalism to globalization. So if we go to NAFTA without first strengthening North America as a basis for regional supply chains, and we are integrated, it's not just autos, it's also commodities, it's also air, um, rim, Blackberry. Um, we're not gonna compete well unless we get a regional act together. I, I think you've raised exactly the right question, which is that this isn't about uh, structures or organizations or agreements or treaties. It's how people view themselves. And unless and until there's a sense of North Americanism, pan-North Americanism, then this is an artificial uh, experiment. Now, that doesn't mean it won't work. I mean, you get people who, who, who ardently defend the European Union as something that started out as the dream of a handful of, of elites, and certainly there are big chunks of Western Europe where um, the generation, the post-Cold War generation, has embraced in a visceral and, 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 and self-identified as being European. And, and so that may very well be the kind of model of, of what works. But there are also big, big chunks of Europe that think this is kind of overdone, overgrown. Um, uh, everybody's got buyer's remorse. And so I'm not uh, suggesting that it's a two or three table thing. I'm suggesting that it won't be validated. North Americanism doesn't get any validation unless and until ordinary people start thinking of themselves as North Americans. And I, I, I don't know anybody. I don't know a single soul who uh, says, I'm a North American. <laughs> and if they did, if somebody said that to me, I wouldn't know what they meant. And I don't think anybody else would. I'm going to follow up on that because I'm going to be very skeptical of what you just said because Europeans don't call themselves Europeans. Yeah, well, I they call them Germans, French. <laughs> They don't think of themselves as European. Pole after pole, mm. they identify themselves with their national identity, Absolutely. not as a European yeah. identity. There are people in their 20s where you get bigger spikes in the polls, but generally I agree yeah. with you. Yeah. And then the other thing is just to emphasize, when, when Bob spoke about the North American idea, is not creating a North American identity. 
that's not at all what the book was about. His point was that the fact that we don't see ourselves as sharing North America, as having something in common, inhibits our ability to effectively work together where and when we need to work together. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I understand what you're saying, Hector, but I also don't want us to get too far off. I, I, I think what Bob's book is about is saying that the lack of this normative sense of we are sort of all in it together and we need to work in it together is inhibiting our ability to work together. So how do we create that normative context? And Bob and I had long conversations about that as well because I, he didn't, I don't think he figured out how we do that. He has some interesting ideas, but I don't think he ever quite figured it out. We need a microphone because, yeah. I don't disagree with the need to do that, and I'm not saying it won't ever happen. Uh, all I'm saying is that there is a uh, strong path dependency with the original intent and design, which was a trade agreement, where the uh, most important of the three countries, the United States, didn't ever mean that to be anything else, which wasn't the case of Europe either, but in the process, uh, many more players mm -hmm. made it more viable and more dynamic, and, and there you have it. You're right on the polls, absolutely, <laughs> about the Europeans, but I want to challenge you saying that when you land in a European airport, they have a special line. <laughs> and there is no line for, you know, when you, when you land in Buenos Aires, you get, you know, Mercosur citizens, <laughs> and uh, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> right? And uh, what is that? It's a mimic, uh, mimicry of that. All right. But, you know. Excellent. Well, look, if we have done one thing, it's start this conversation again. And I think that was sort of the uh, objective that we wanted and getting all these viewpoint point, points out and talking, uh, I think, also uh, with the memory of Dr. Pastor, I think is also very important. I think we achieved both things. This discussion will continue. I think it's the right thing. It's inevitable that we are going to have to be dealing with these issues either as agreements or either, uh, either as, as, as something that we're going to have to talk about within the context of, uh, of an identity because I think it's part of the discussion, not the focal part of the discussion, but part of the discussion. So uh, without further ado, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank Paul. I want to thank Jaime, Carlo. Pamela, you guys have been great. It's been a really good discussion, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.